Now you are. Now we are live. Uh, okay. It will take some seconds for them to respond in the chat. Please let us know if you can hear us and see us, uh, so we know we are talking to people. So there is some echo. I don't know who is it, uh, but there is some echo there. If you can mute yourselves, okay. Okay, so you can hear us. I can see that people are responding. Uh, yeah, so th then we can start now. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this sixth ses session of the Brains to Time Reading Club. So we are very glad today. We have a, a, an amazing list of speakers. As usual, we have Paul Cisek, Luis Puelles, and we have Barbara Fille and Bruno Averbeck, who will tell us about interesting topics related to the chapter six, that is the one that we are discussing today. As usual, we will have a summary that I will try to do as quick as possible. Uh, and then Barbara will uh, tell us about uh, maps in the brain and Bruno about the model uh, he recently developed. I will give you the actual uh, title in a second. And, and since we have a lot of to discuss, I will share my screen and start the, the presentation and then we can uh, uh, move on and discuss about the brain of mammals in comparison to birds, etc. Et so please let us know if there is some issue in the chat with the uh, with the audio or with the video. I think it, everything works well, it seems. But if there is any issue, Raquel and Alex will be there, uh, are monitoring the the chat. So let me just share my screen. This is it. So can you see the presentation? Can can you confirm with audio because I cannot see anything? Okay. Yes. And if I go enter if I enter uh, presentation mode, I I guess you can see it. So yep. yeah, cool. Okay, so I will start then. As I said, we are discussing today chapter six. Uh, it is the last, well, not exactly the last, but the last chapter in, of the book with uh, content about the vertebrates brain. Uh, the name is The Rise of Endothermy, Mammals, but also Birds. I, I will mainly talk about mammals, making always the comparison or, uh, almost always with, with birds to, for you to have an, a, a reference in comparison to what we talked about in the previous session. So this is this chapter we have already talked about many uh, many changes through uh, through the phylogenetic tree. We, we have talked about cyclostome, fishes, amphibians, and sauropsids. And in this chapter, as I said, is the last chapter that, that has uh, content about the vertebrates brain. Uh, we are able to connect and establish links with all these previous modifications that we discussed in previous uh, chapters. And as I said before, today we have uh, Barbara Finlay, who will tell us about maps in the brain uh, from the vertebrate body plan to a mammalian action plan, and Bruno Aberbeck, who will tell us about a model to account for the forebrain anatomical connectivity in primates. Um, and of course, we have Paul Cisek and Luis Puelles, who, as always, will be making comments, questions, and answering questions as well. Um, let me just tell you that this is uh, three of us that are organizing this. Raquel, uh, Alex, and myself. Raquel and Alex will be monitoring the chat, trying to answer your questions and any issue you can have, you may have. And they actually have helped me quite a lot with the presentation. So thanks for that. <laughs> and, and we also want to thank Worldwide Neuro for letting us use their, their Crowdcast account and the Barksing uh, community in Barcelona and the Instituto de Neurociencias in Alicante. So I will not wait much more because uh, there is a lot to discuss. Uh, I actually had to skip many relevant and interesting details of the chapter in order to fit everything in 20 minutes. I also reorganized a bit the figures uh, because uh, I felt uh, more comfortable with this organization. But you will see that I am indicating the figure I'm talking about uh, in all uh, the slides. So please uh, let us know if there is something that you some question you have or something that you find that is not correct. I have been learning a lot of how to pronounce many different words. Uh, 
So please let me know if there is something that I that I mistake. Um, so we start with this uh, phylogenetic tree in which I, I wanted to show you what we've been talking about. So first in chapter three, it was uh, ray fin fishes and cartilaginous fishes. Then we moved to tetrapods, uh, talking about amphibians. And in the previous session, we talked about amniotes. But in this uh, divergence, we turned right and talked about sauropsids, which included uh, turtles, lizards, uh, crocodiles, and birds. Uh, birds will be mentioned several times uh, today because they are they have they share many similarities with with mammals. But also, the chapter makes an effort to to compare with previous stages with uh, amphibians on or non-avian sauropsids. So for you to understand how mammals synapses uh, emerged, uh, I turned this uh, 90 degrees. We have sauropsids here. And you can see that the phylogenetic uh, tree of synapses is pretty complex. It extends a long period and with many uh, different uh, branches, lineages that actually uh, many of them disappear at the end of the Permian because this, there was this huge extinction. Um, and then uh, it, it was mainly the mammalia forms who will who live through this Mesozoic uh, era that is the Tri Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. Uh, this era is the era, the age of reptiles, as it's known. Uh, and so our animals, our friends, the mammalia forms, had to live with these angry animals that wanted to eat them. Uh, and they had to escape uh, via becoming nocturnal, becoming much smaller, as you can see here. This is the comparison in size of this uh, ly lycanops, uh, trinaxodon, and more, more ganucodon. So you can see the skeletons here. And the, the most straightforward see, uh, way to see how much they shrink is to compare the more ganucodon to the therapsid, the lycanops. You can see that they become very tiny and actually they become uh, very small, uh, nocturnal, and they used to live in trees, mainly uh, eating uh, insects. And this life was uh, helped quite a lot by this uh, uh, um, amazing innovation that happened independently in mammals and birds, that is endothermy, that is the capacity of the body to generate its own uh, heat. Uh, and so there are many. There were many factors that influenced that uh, that allow this this capacity. First, the the obvious is the hair that is isolate the brain, inverses feathers. Then we have shivering that generates heat by moving uh, by contracting the muscles. Uh, this other uh, uh, way of producing uh, heat is was very interesting to me. Is like making the the membranes of the cell of the cells leak here, so they need to spend energy to maintain the ion concentrations. And this, this energy produces uh, heat. And the thing they, they mainly focus in the, in the chapter is these nasal turbinates that allow to retain heat and moisture. And you can see these nasal turbinates of echidna, that this is a, a monotreme. I will mention this. I will show you the phylogenetic tree in a second. Uh, the opossum and this bird that is the emu, you can see these complex structures that allow to maintain uh, heat and moisture. Um, birds had a bit smaller surface area in the turbinate, uh, um, nasal turbinates, but they compensate with these long trackers that uh, also help uh, helps them uh, maintain the heat and the moisture. Okay, so let's. Uh, so this. Oh, this is the. The, the one important factor to be able to to produce heat is to be able to to acquire to 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 get all the energy you need for that and for that they mentioned that the larger brains that this that mammals develop uh, was key and it's actually a kind of a feedback loop because when you have larger brains you obtain more energy when you obtain more energy you can have larger brains so there is some positive feedback there. Uh, they actually uh, emphasize quite a lot this uh, encephalization of mammals, and they have a whole section in the chapter, which is actually very interesting. They talk about number of neurons, etc. I will skip most of it, uh, just showing you this figure that compares the size of the brain of non-avian sauropsids with that of birds and mammals. And this shows clearly that birds and mammals had a, has a, have, sorry, um, a larger brains compared to the body weight. Okay. 
So if we come back to the to our final genetic tree um, and we follow this path to mammalia forms, we finally get to our modern mammals, the monotremes, the placental mammals and the marsupials, which one thing that became so obvious with this uh, phylogenetic tree is that at some point that diversified enormously, uh, especially for placental mammals, you can see that by the end of the Cretaceous, they expanded uh, incredibly. And, and this, the reason is, and you might have guessed it, guessed it, is that the dinosaurs became extinct. And at that point, we have a, again the same tree, the monotremes, the marsupials, and the, and the placental mammals. The placental mammals expanded enormously. They occupy many habitats and they diversify enormously into these four uh, families that I will now try to pronounce, the Senatra, the Afrotheria, the Laurasia theria, and the Eowar contoglyphs. So if you didn't know you are an Eowar contoglyphs, I didn't know and I had to, to learn to pronounce this. Um, and as you might have guessed, the number of placental mammals is well, as you see, uh, it's much larger than marsupials or, or monotremes. You can see also numbers of uh, within the placental mammals that the number of rodents is the, is the larger than bats, insectivores, and primates. Um, just for you to have an idea of how mammals look, I, I'm sure you know how they look, but there are many different uh, types of mammals. For instance, the monotremes with the platypus uh, and the echidna. Um, the dwarf opossum, the kangaroo, and then we have all these placental mammals that that come in, in very different sizes. And actually, the size seems to be the key uh, aspect, the key factor to produce this uh, characteristic folding of the neocortex that we have seen always in our own brains, but also in in the chimpanzee, etc. So it is when the the brain becomes a bit uh, large enough, then it becomes the neural cortex starts folding uh, on itself because the surface doesn't grow as much as the as the volume of the neural cortex. Okay, so these are our our uh, main animals of today's uh, uh, session. I will mention briefly the the sensory abilities they develop or mostly. Maybe they actually lost some sens sensory abilities, especially in the in the case of visual, uh, in the visual system, because as they became nocturnal, they lost this uh, uh, green sensitive opsin, that is the Rh2, and then later when they became uh, diurnal, they had to develop uh, or reinvent this this uh, variant from what was left from the opsins that were left to be able to cover the the whole wavelength uh, spectrum. Another uh, another uh, important feature is that the eyes became more forward facing, uh, which is which might help uh, detecting light in low light environments as uh, during night, and uh, and also uh, for a stereo stereoscopic uh, vision to especially for for predators to hunt their prey. Um, I will move now to the hearing. Which also, uh, which actually improved quite a lot. Uh, hearing in uh, at night it becomes very, very important. There were these uh, these bones that are the malleus and the incus that are homologs to to jaw bones in, in lizards that became the, that detached completely from the from the jaw and this allow uh, allowed the system to improve the hearing abilities. And one important one thing that seems very important is that they could hear and chew at the same time, mamas which uh, one believe that lizards could, but apparently they, they can't. Um, and then the vestibular apparatus also uh, changed. Uh, uh, the cochlea became much longer. This is something that we already mentioned for sauropsids. This longer uh, cochlea allows for this to discriminate sounds of different frequencies and possibly to to for high frequency hearing. This high frequency hearing, as we discussed in the previous chapter, helps uh, first uh, hunting insects, uh, discriminating vocalizations of, of mates, and also detecting uh, detecting preys, um, uh, sorry, pre predators. Um, 
And this is uh, all I will say about sensory uh, system. They also talk about uh, somatosensation and about olfaction. Uh, I will enc I encourage you to, to look at the chapter, but I, I wanted to really uh, summarize the, the chapter. So I will move to the, to the brain. The brain of mammals changed I, in many parts of the brain change considerably. Uh, we will start with the hindbrain, uh, and I will be using this schematic that I already used in the previous session because it helps me know uh, where I am in the brain. Uh, so if you remember the, the, the hindbrain or the, the cochlear nuclei of, of birds, the, there were two, the nucleus angularis and the nucleus magnocellularis. In mammals, we actually have three that are the anteroventral, the dorsal, and the posteroventral. And all these three, apparently, they receive auditory nerve axons that are uh, local, uh, organized tonotopically. So you can see that different frequencies arrive at different uh, parts of the, of the nuclei. And they arrive to all different nuclei. OK? Uh, so we move to the cerebellum, which actually is very, very similar to that of uh, birds. It's something we already mentioned in previous sessions. So you can see the comparison of uh, the cerebellum of the Chilean tinamo with the rat cerebellum. And you can see they are very similar at sight, of course. In humans, the cerebellum became, it seems smaller in comparison to the neocortex. But actually what they mention is that in primates, the cerebellum within primates, the cerebellum increase more, increased more than the neocortex. This is something that they call the great shift. Uh, they, I'm not showing the figures, but just to, to keep it simple, but uh, this was something interesting uh, to me. Uh, in the midbrain of, of birds, we used to have the tectum and the torus, the optic tectum and the torus semicircularis that, take a, that are in charge of processing visual and auditory stimulus. In mammals, we have the homologs that are the superior colliculus and inferior colliculus. What they say is that in mammals, the superior colliculus uh, kind of lose uh, uh, relevance, um, maybe um, probably because uh, there was this shift towards the forebrain when processing uh, visual information. So the superior colliculus will still guide the gaze, but all this fine discrimination of the visual uh, scene will be done, is done by the forebrain. Um, so here you have some examples of the, of how the superior colliculus and inferior colliculus look like. In echolocating bats and dolphins, the inferior colliculus is very important because auditory system is very important for these animals. But in more visual animals like the ibex and the tarsier, uh, it is the superior, the superior colliculus is, is larger. Okay, they have this a uh, very nice figure, as I said, they compare, they, they make the effort of comparing amphibians with reptiles, uh, birds and mammals, and you can see the evolution of these areas. Uh, for instance, you can see that the axis along which the inferior colliculus uh, span changed in, mammal, in mammals. And they also mentioned something that I found interesting is that, um, so there was no an extra area created uh, to process auditory information. Uh, and it, this seems to be a, a useful method for evolution to create, uh, to be able to process uh, new sensory information. So they say something like, all brain regions are able to accommodate new sensory inputs. So you just create new sensory inputs and, and the all brain regions are able to process that new information, which seems easier to, to, uh, to do than to have to produce or to create a new area for each new sensory input that you that you find uh, or that you create by modifying the periphery. Okay, uh, so there was a uh, huge change in the thalamus uh, of mammals. Uh, here they compared the the thalamus of lizards with that of chickens, and then this is um, echidnas or monotrem. But you can see that the when we divide this posterior thalamic zone and the anterior thalamic zone. Uh, mainly the anterior, anterior thalamic zone uh, is not differentiated in, in lizards, but it is very parcellated in, in echidna, as you can see. And, and actually, if we move to, human, to the human thalamus, the parcellation is even uh, more complex, and, and the thalamus of humans uh, is a much more uh, complex structure. And they mentioned this Ebison parcellation theory that says that a single ancestral cell ancestral cell group 
might divide in, in multiple descendant nuclei that actually take care of different subsets of uh, the ancestral features, okay? So basically you have a group of cells that are taking care of uh, several functions and then you create different parcellations of this that take care of each of these functions. I don't know if this was clear, but uh, I encourage you to read this, this part because they mentioned different uh, interpretations of the homologues of different parts of the thalamus between birds, uh, amphibians, and, and mammals. Um, another very important uh, feature of the thalamus of mammals is that uh, it established many reciprocal uh, connections with the cortical areas, with different cortical areas. These are the solid lines. Um, and this is uh, thought to, to be used to, for the neural uh, for the cortical areas to convey information to other cortical areas. So, and this is uh, thought to be a mammalian innovation, uh, which, is, which is, seems to be a complete reorganization. Or, or to me, it seemed like a complete reorganization of, the, of how the brain of the mammals works in, in comparison to, to uh, their ancestors. Um, we move to the telencephalon, uh, passing first through the stratopallidum that, uh, for what I understood, is a very conserve, uh, um, a very conserved uh, structure, but there were the connections from the stratopallidum to other areas changed dramatically from amphibians to mammals. In the original figure, there is a, another brain uh, schematizing the brain of non sauropsis but for 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 simplicity, I, I remove it, but you can see here actually that the stratopallidum of amphibians was connecting directly to the medulla and spinal cord, and this was removing mammals. And more importantly, uh, there were several pathways that were created between the stratum, the pallidum, the thalamus, and the pallium, uh, especially the pallidothalamopallia, so this pathway, and then the thalamopalliostriata. Uh, so this created kind of a feedback loop that is, uh, that is thought to, uh, to play a, a very important role in controlling the behavior of, of mammals, okay? Okay, so we get to the neocortex. Uh, the neocortex is probably the one that, uh, the main difference that I would uh, say if you ask me what is the difference between the brain of, of a snake and, uh, and a cat. Uh, it is very unique in terms of in, in, the, in the pallium. Uh, and, and it has a very unique structure that is organized into layers, uh, usually six layers, as you can see in, in the cortex of the mouse, uh, as compared to the dorsal, uh, cord the dorsal pallium of turtle and twatteras. Uh, these different layers uh, develop are built during development with the different neurons migrating uh, to uh, more and more superficial areas, uh, layers, sorry. So you can see that this is the day of uh, they are born and the, the farther they are born, the farther they go in, 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 in the surface. And, and this produce a kind of a columnar, a columnar uh, way of processing sensory information or other type of information that comes from, from the white matter. So this information arrives at layer four that goes then to layer two, three. Here we have many different layers because this is the monkey. And then we have uh, the information going to layer five, layers five and six, who, uh, which send the information back to the striatum and the thalamus as we have seen uh, in the previous slides. Okay, so the, the striatum, the, sorry, the neocortex develop, uh, expanded enormously through evolution. What they say here is that this expansion uh, happens uh, kind of in different ways for different branches of, of mammals. So if you look at the hypothetical ancestor, uh, it, it already con uh, had the uh, primary and secondary uh, sensory areas. But when we look at any other, any uh, extant mammal, we see that these areas are actually not that big. So the, the neocortex expanded a lot, but it, it was mostly the, the ter territories in between that expanded a lot. And this makes very difficult to establish homologies between these different areas because they, uh, they probably develop uh, or evolve as uh, to respond to the, the challenges that each branch encounter in their habitat. So 
uh, so yeah so for instance in primates uh, one part of the uh, cortex that uh, develop uh, enormously is the, the prefrontal cortex that even producing a, a new area that contains granular uh, neurons and all this structure that it, you can see is not present it's almost not present in in rodents it, well it is actually present in, in rodents the prefrontal cortex but it's not as developed as in monkeys is supposed uh, to be a key for complex behaviors um, and they show actually a, an experiment with macaque, macaque uh, monkeys in which they show that they are able to learn the rule of a task much faster than any other animals and uh, I believe it's the same experiment when they disconnect the prefrontal cortex from the inferior tem temporal cortex this the, the performance um, um, decreased enormously so uh, it seems that this prefrontal area in primates is key for these complex behaviors uh, and complex um, yeah also for uh, uh, to live in, in, in different in, in large communities of of primates um, so I will stop here I, I I'm not sure how 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 much I, I it took me. Uh, I just want to emphasize that I skipped many parts of the of the chapter that I encourage you to read because they are very interesting. Many dis discussions about homologies that I didn't have the time or, or the knowledge to enter in. Um, probably we will enter now uh, with the discussion with Barbara, Bruno, and uh, Luis and, and and Paul. So I will let uh, Barbara uh, start. Uh, uh, her presentation. I will stop sharing. And hopefully you could, yeah. Un 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 so, so do you have Do you have headphones or something? Because it seems you have some echo. So is it possible that you have two windows open or open or I don't know what the where this echo could could be coming from. You don't have headphones, right? So you are muted now uh, because because when you when you unmute yourself, okay, now it seems to work. Can you talk? Yeah, so I just turned the volume down. You can hear me all right. Yeah, but you still have some echo, so if you turn the volume a bit more down, it might help. You want me to be louder? Just uh, lower your volume. Uh, uh, the speakers are all. The, the, you, is that okay? But I, yes, yes, okay. I think it's okay. You wanna you wanna share your screen? Your screen. Okay, can you see me all right? We can see you, but we are not uh, we are not seeing your screen. Okay, what? what? You're not we are not seeing your your screen. I am I seeing my screen, screen, but I can't hear you very well. So what? did you try to share your screen? I did, I did share, share my, my screen. screen. We are not seeing it. Oh. Uh. Now. Okay, there we go. Yeah, try to go to 
to presentation mode to see if right, right. i'm going to you still have some echo but yeah you can try maybe we can yes i i, I will I lose hearing, hearing you, you but, but are we okay? okay maybe it's your microphone i don't know hmm. No, maybe now it's fine. I, I will I will uh, mute my 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 mic and you can start. How is how's the echo now? I think it's better. It's much better. Yeah, you can start now. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. Um, okay. Well, uh, thank you so much for uh, uh, inviting me to do this. It's a uh, it's been an extremely interesting. Uh, uh, discussion with everybody all along and um, and it's been a, a great deal of fun to get such a diverse set of um, views on how the brain evolves. Uh, anyway, but today what I'll be talking about is not something that directly comes up in much of George's books, George's book, but um, uh, is, is very central to themes that have been um, started in the very beginning of the whole discussion here, and that is um, the use of maps in brain development and the use of, of explicitly mapped um, uh, dimensions in computation in adult maps. So that's what I'll be trying to put together here. And um, and the information on, on how such uh, topographic or non-topographic maps of, of spaces uh, is now going to be pretty extensive. So we have uh, a lot of uh, information to look at. Uh, OK, so uh, take her all the way back to the be beginning here and talk about the um, initial map that has been occupying so much attention so that's the segmental map of the vertebrate body. Um, that was uh, the average Hox gene expression, the original work in the uh, in the nineties, and then uh, Luis Palacios and Cruz prosomeric model. Um, and and we've been discussing this these two things for the most part uh, analytically um and in terms of uh, what's what's the use of a segment uh what's the use of polarization of the embryo and so forth but i i'd like to point out a different thing about those that it's these two uh organizational features of the whole body the the, the um somatic body there and the brain that that together allow um direct correspondence between the information in the outside world and the motor and sensory abilities of the embryo. Um, and not in just a general way, but in a, a specific way of mapping particular regions of space, particular regions of the, of the motor brain and the somatic brain together. <laughs> so um, if you look at uh, a fate map such as this uh, extremely detailed one of Garcia Lopez and crew, um, and you look at what its import is, and I didn't include the spinal cord, but what what this um, what these two maps together allow is for uh, immediately corresponding locations in the embryo, um, spatial, uh, sensory, motor, and the outside and inside world they represent to be represented in neighboring parts of the brain, and that continues. All, all the way up until we get, um, with elaborations, it gets to be even more essential, I think, in sort of the differentiated, differentiated facial parts of the of the rhombencephalon. But but then um, we have to understand the uh, cerebellum, uh, midbrain, and forebrain in that context. And I'm going to be making a very specific kind of case here. Um, that we're going to uh, look at the optic tectum to start just with fish um, as adding a, another more organizational map to the, the map of the spinal cord to um, the uh, sensory and motor and world periphery. Um, now the, uh, 
this is interestingly one of the longest studied structures in 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 the brain, sort of contempt of contemporary-ish neuroscientists. So the original uh, study of uh, Nobelist Roger Sperry, Nobelist for split brain work, not this. Uh, 1944 studies of optic nerve regeneration with return to vision in aneurysms. Uh, in this case, it was a newt that he looked at first, and his and his interest was um, understanding regeneration, and, and this caused him to generate the uh, chemospecificity that there were lock and key relationships between um, local components of. Uh, input and output, in this case, between the optic nerve and the, um, and the midbrain tectum. Um, now, um, it might be odd to realize that there's, there's very little anatomy in here. What this is, is uh, cutting the optic nerve. And then what uh, Sferi looked at was how the animal was able to uh, accurately locate small items of food dangled in, it, in its visual field. Um, and that, that really underlines something about the midbrain tectum um, that uh, across most animals, this, uh, uh, it was for very fast, accurate food localization um, depends on the tectum and it's very robust and uh, uh, all, you know, very, very wide range of animals will, uh, exhibit this behavior, behavior for you. The famous one, I think, um, that uh, uh, may have derailed some electrophysiological research in some ways, or at least caused much controversy, was Jerry Letman's um, What the Frog's Eye Tells the Frog's Brain, or What the Frog's Eye Tells the Tectum, and the idea that the tectum and the eye was uh, specialized for fly detection uh, particularly. So we'll, I'll come in a bit. So I wanna set in the fact that this has been worked on so long in such a variety of animals and then go back to look at, at teleos and particularly uh, sort of highlighting recent work on uh, zebrafish larvae here. Um, really quite a lovely study here. And, and the things I will mention here are characteristic of the zebrafish embryo, but really, um, all uh, uh, teleos that I'm aware of uh, with allowances for uh, blindness or special, very special sensory specializations. Um, and also these ones, they will be true for um, uh, land mammals and also or land animals and mammals as well. So, um, so the first thing, vision is the dominant uh, sense, but very rarely the only one. And it is a highly topographic one. So what you can see here, are the differently colored regions of the retina occupying different regions of the optic tectum. And um, in confirmation of Sperry, in some ways, these uh, 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 projections appear to be accurately organized um, right away um, uh, in the, within a, with the beginning of function. So, um, we have um, a dish not shown in this particular one, but also uh, depending on the animal. Um, uh, we have localizing information in other sensory systems. The electroreception and lateral line will also uh, be represented um, in the midbrain tectum or uh, occasionally uh, represented by uh, a sort of modulatory input like olfaction. Um, one highly conserved feature of the behavior depending on uh, on the midbrain tectum is that it's not just approach to foodstuffs, but rather avoidance. So in the superficial layers of the tectum, um, stimulation or presenting a small uh, bit of food uh, will um, cause the animal to act, turn to and accurately um, in this case, consume the food pellet or the food particle um, with its mouth. Um, if you do the same thing um, and, look, and, and then present a net dimming or other uh, present a barrier or something, that will activate the lower layers and um, produce a uh, turn away, uh, uh, which has more detail to it than I'll go into here. <laughs> 
then then one thing that that's um, particularly important that doesn't often get uh, emphasized is the, whether or not um, these behaviors occur is highly modulated by um, both the basal ganglia and the forebrain, and that's been studied for many years. Um, uh, one interesting feature that uh, is uh, specific to fish, I think, um, but I'm not sure if there's a common, a similar thing perhaps in birds, is that uh, thing called rheotaxis, which is orientation to current to our, uh, many fish uh, position them um, straight in to the current flow, uh, which is energetically efficient among other things. And this is uh, vestibular primarily, but uses other information sources too. But vestibular information is not used for um, place holding in the current or, or um, other things that you might uh, imagine that's elsewhere. So we have um, a topographic map, multimodal map, uh, two, kind, two distinct kinds of behaviors belonging of approach and avoidance, but both are angularly precise. And, um, uh, and then uh, incorporation into the animals um, uh, behavioral state. So I want to, um, whoops, Did I, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, is my okay there? Can you see me all right? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about the um, optic tectum as in a little slightly different way than just a place for orienting. Um, this is something that sort of starts with uh, the way Bjorn Merker and some others describe it. Let's think, that, but rather thinking of it in, perhaps in terms of different kinds of information architectures or, or whatever. You have to take what seen as a, as a model fish um, inside the brain. Um, one that is taking uh, the whole range of information to a degree that the fish can in encounter, and it's putting that into an egocentric frame. And the point of the, inf the importance of that is for action. And what it's going to do with that information is calculate motor decisions uh, to approach or avoid. Um, and that's going to be all modulated by its motor state. So this red bit here sitting in the technum is supposed to be the you know, uh, dorsal view of a, of a fish. And, and in fact, how it is spatially arranged with respect to the midbrain technum. Um, so just a, a couple details here about what uh, kind of sensory information is integrated and how it's done. Uh, it's quite ingenious. Uh, so for the viral zebrafish, the small particle recognition um, is limited by a physical factor, which is the fish is quite myopic and they can't focus anything uh, very far away from it. Uh, so it doesn't have a problem of, of uh, detecting, you know, you know, sharks at a great distance and mistaking them for food. Uh, receptive field properties of uh, tectal neurons uh, are, are small and uh, mutually inhibitory. Um, and, um, one thing that will happen both in this fish and um, across phylogeny and in mammals is that elaborations that will have be identification and approach of much larger items um, for different purposes. Uh, that's uh, it's all not for flies, which still appears in some textbooks. And then uh, new sensory systems will be integrated. Um, uh, I'm not going to be talking much about it, but it's directional dimming. One. Now we have two two distinct kinds of orientations here. Uh, the orientation to maintain alignment with current, which is in the basal part of the tectum and is, uh, as I mentioned, vestibular. Um, an interesting point of, the, of what the tectum does is uh, that its basic computation for an approach decision is winner take all. So there's lateral inhibition between neurons in the tectum and uh, the most active one will inhibit the others and will be by that mechanism um, wins the, direct, the competition for which direction the animal will turn. Um, and 
Uh, so location gives you the angular position. Vergence helps with uh, depth calculation or distance calculations at times. And then immediately will be elaborations for analysis of barriers and prey types. Um, and then uh, modulation by motivational state both uh, comes from within um, the tegmentum in the midbrain and in um, gating and motor decisions through the basal ganglia and other kinds of forebrain contextual mod modification. So the, the uh, so if the um, optic tectum is a model fish, then what? What happens in a mammal? Uh, so Malcolm's already talked about um, what changes when vertebrates come onto land and particularly how the visual information uh, dramatically um, increases and how the sort of distribution of that information, it's sort of spatial layout on land does. Um, and also locomotion on land uh, loses one thing, which is the need to typically uh, factor very strong currents um, in localization decisions, uh, we're not often in hurricanes, um, but has to pick up having to constantly oppose gravity successfully. Uh, so I'll be talking about those uh, features. They're rather going straight to what do mammals tell us about what's changed in the brain in response to those uh, changing uh, information availability and, and changing locomotion. So there's, um, and I, I will be um, not. I will not be able to be very, very clear or detailed, and will never mean to imply that suddenly mammals did all this. Of course, you know, I will not be talking, be able to talk about reptiles and other uh, kinds of things. These things did not happen simultaneously and suddenly appear in mammals. Just to be clear about that, that we get piecemeal addition of these things. But looking at mammals, what we have is a. Uh, linked suite of changes in how the eye is laid out and and how mobile it is and for what purposes. Um, so first off, you'll see that the um, we have a dramatic increase in sort of the um, dramatic nature of retinal specializations for high acuity versus panoramic vision. So uh, uh, receptors will be um, packed at much higher density um, in the high acuity central regions or extremely packed as in uh, foveal regions in in primates and birds. Um, and because of the how the eye grows, which is to grow like a balloon, um, this is usually uh, a, a zero sum game. So you, sub, you get your high acuity packing by depleting your panoramic vision, uh, particularly in, in primates. Um, so there's, so you concentrate on, you can use high acuity search in particular areas then, but to do that, you need mobilize. Uh, you have a much larger range of ang angular amount of saccades, uh, visual pursuit um, can be added uh, to the basic uh, function of, of mobility in eyes, which is stabilizing the eye with respect to drift in the current. And finally, um, once you don't have to keep straight in the current, a, newble, a newly mobile neck will I'll give you this, a mobile head and still more ability to search the environment. Um, the, in terms of the goal of orienting and, attract, and uh, catching food and so forth, um, what the end point could be, what the goal is, is now quite diverse. It's really kind of unlimited in a way. So fractionation of gaze can be moving just the eyes, the eyes and the head, um, the whole head or the whole body. Uh, the latter would be just one thing considering fish. Um, you can grasp with the mouth or just, you know, nose something uh, and uh, orient any part of the body. Then with, with the um, limbs, we can have problems of uh, limb placement and and limbs can be also used, uh, you know, placement is important. And as in this, one of these uh, leaping squirrels of Lucy Jacobs out in, uh, out in uh, San Francisco, I believe. Um, uh, but grasp is also uh, important. 
So um, I'm going to be suggesting here that uh, there's, there's an important feature of this that might get overlooked, which is um, if you can't locate and act on what you've seen, it doesn't do any good to have all these mobile platforms for visual search and, and analysis of the visual field. Um, so you absolutely must get these things together, get them together accurately and rapidly. Um, and if, and I think this this integration of the mobile platform of the eye and and the dissociability of parts of the body, I think that's an unavoidable computational priority. And we're talking about how the this a lot of this uh, depends upon the neocortex, and since it is so primary, a lot of neocortical computation might derive from what was originally a necessity for this kind of visual motor integration. Okay, so just a, a bit here, um, alterations in the superior colliculus. Um, so um, uh, I think as I already mentioned, the, the colliculus is, is relatively smaller, uh, relatively smaller compared to how much the rest of the brain grows. And these uh, nice graphics here are those of uh, Meredith and Stein and Mervig in the census. So you can see the size of the colliculus compared to the cortex, but also in this slide, the, the, the cellular lamination becomes quite distinct. Um, the superficial layers of the colliculus direct the species typical gaze to a, a precise location in space. And the lower layers, as in the marine uh, vertebrates, um, gives a um, opposite escape movement, uh, which is not usually a lovely backflip, but uh, usually a kind of clumsy scramble if, uh, in the average rodent. Um, there's one other interesting thing too, that um, active sensory alignment here. So, uh, turning ears toward a, a visually recognized target is something that the, is organized in the mammalian colliculus. I'm not sure, but uh, similar things in fish. Um, then we are adding other kinds of spatial components, auditory and traversal. And I, I'm uh, citing myself here just because I would like to point out I've been doing, that was part of my thesis. Okay. And um, that's a, uh, so I've been working on this particular thing for some 45, pushing 50 years now, and um, yeah, it's been interesting. Okay. Um, so the uh, um, now, in terms of uh, how the the superior colliculus can handle the problem of multiple mo mobile platforms and new things to control, uh, so they're in cats and. Uh, Monkeys to a degree, several other animals, you can see re-registration of sensory motor maps ever after eye movement. That, so what I mean by that is if the eye, say, moves 20 degrees to the right, and we have a stimulus that originally had been at zero, and you want to reach to that point, you're going to uh, have to take account of the eye movements and where your reach is done. And so this kind of shift um, subsequent to an eye movement can be calculated in the, in the spirit colliculus. It hasn't, to my knowledge, been observed for head movements. Uh, but uh, one thing that's definitely true is control of limbs is not a collicular function. Uh, that, that is a, a cortical one. So the whole midbrain can, in fact, um, um, you know, direct motion forward and back and so forth. That, that includes the limbs, but uh, not directing them. Um, one kind, one additional thing, uh, the uh, control of eye movements and orienting becomes increasingly um, uh, spread around the brain so that numerous sites can initiate it. So in primates and in most mammals, control of saccades will, or orienting movements will um, survive loss of the colliculus entirely. Um, but um, even in even in humans, who you where you think it might not play much of a role. Um, there's something that a hamster does or most rodents when they exit from a burrow, which is to um, stand up on their on their haunches and look around, uh, survey the scene. Um, and uh, the same thing in a different way is true in primates, which is just um, 
when you're just sitting around, you're very rarely just staring straight in the space. You're looking around all the time. Um, so in macaques and in human neurological cases, uh, loss of the collicula stops that sort of uh, stimulus, sort of uh, uh, initiated visual exploration. Um, but uh, as a sort of a, a strategy of visual exploration seems to be depend on the integrity of the structure. Okay, so. So we got to get the, all the shifting platforms integrated and goal-centered action referred to new body parts and how to do that. So um, I use a, an unusual, slightly unusual way of looking at the cortex here. So I have um, taken this map that's been used for the, a number of uh, studies by Markov and then with uh, Van Ness and then Kennedy. Um, and uh, They've done an anatomic uh, tracing study of all the different cortical areas here in their different colors. And um, so this is a laid out cortex to begin with. So up here, um, we can see uh, the right cortex anterior this way uh, with its um, sulci and gyri a little bit exploded. So you can see uh, where the uh, feet you one is here. Okay, then they um, unroll this, flatten it, um, cut it in two parts once uh, through on the midline of the visual cortex and also anteriorly in such a way that um, distortion, aerial distortion is minimized. So we have now a laid out flattened cortex uh, inferior here, me below, uh, medial up here. Um, anterior poster, rostral caudal on this axis. So we can see it better here. Um, uh, oh, I, I would go on a little bit here. This this then is taking this map and, and recoloring it to show, uh, highlight the primary sensory areas and the dark ones because they serve as anchors and to show which areas have essentially uh, continuous nearest neighbor topography within them. There's breaks at the color borders and those are kind of a result of a developmental feature. Um, and then I want a, a final thing that helps to explain um, something about the mapping of this structure. So um, basically we've, we've taken the adult thing and I'm trying to get back to the original cortical plate um, and, and it's, sort of potential components as you can see them in, in the original embryonic structure. So uh, so this is uh, medial, anterior, posterior, uh, lat lateral, but this would be underneath here. And the um, so, so the cortex has several interesting features. It has always um, uh, a preference for point to point connections with immediately adjacent neurons. So it, it has an array to array mapping over the whole surface. Um, for the lateral convexity, this part here that we're seeing, um, that is the entire thing is, uh, has an egocentric map to it. So, so what we find here are uh, lower visual fields, uh, bigger lower visual fields, um, feet and maps, kicking the feet and maps, and then on this edge, upper upper visual fields, um, and uh, planning as it's, as it's associated with prefrontal stuff here also. Um, and, and the fact that this is an egocentric map, just because of the complexity of this, this isn't really seen. It's not uh, detailed, but it's uh, you know clear when you see it. Um, so I've, I've just, for reference, put in a uh, terrain and a person, the homunculus, which is usually seen hanging by its toes from the midline here. Then there is a, a part of the cortex, which is, I've always called it the temporal ghetto. Um, this has the same feature of being um, topographically connected from one area to another into the ex external sensory or motor areas. Um, in a nearest neighbor relationship to preserve, but these are things that are non-topographic, um, like the parts of vision, uh, faces, and objects that aren't egocentric, or um, 
the auditory system, which is tone topic. Any spatial uh, auditory stuff is just intermixed in here. It doesn't have an area, the insula. Okay, so that's so. So this was basically to establish that um, we have a particular kind of mapping, and it's embedded in this spatial, um, this egocentric spatial arrangement. Now, what parts of that are going to be critical here? Well, I've outlined those this bunch crudely in in white. So um, here are mostly visual, and up here we, we are getting more somatosensory and visual together. So these are the area seven, LI, uh, mostly uh, acronym salad, basically. Uh, but uh, the important thing, it's, it's the, these regions are, are um, four or five steps up in the visual hierarchy in primates. Uh, they're numerous and small. They include somatosensory and other external inputs. Okay, so um, now the, the interesting thing here is what, uh, what neuroscientists before they knew expected to find. I'm gonna talk about it this way. I think it's just interesting and also because um, it helps explain what the computation is of a bit. So um, given uh, popular ideas about, and correct ideas about um, hierarchical sequential organization in the cortex, pe um, people were really looking for something that was, uh, that started with a retinotopic map and that would have been supplied by V1 going up to uh, four V4, uh, you know, representing uh, the visual, whole visual ray in an orderly way. And then, then people were looking for uh, a head-centered map. Now, what, what is that? So you add changing eye positions so that instead of re representing where visual stimulus is with respect to retinal coordinates, now we could represent um, by just algebraic operations, you you add or subtract the changing eye position and get a position of what the animal is, is look is interested in looking at or had a visual um, angle. Uh, now we're going to give the location of things with respect to the head and not the eye by uh, adding in the eye position to our representation. So our first map in in a hierarchy of maps would be to generate from the retinal map a head centered map. Okay, then the head has, uh, can move as well. So we want to do the exact same operation uh, to, to the head-centered map, and we're going to add um, a changing head position to get a body-centered map. And that could be one of these STP ones. So uh, as we go from one uh, area to the next, we um, add a, a piece of information about spatial arrangement and get a new map. In this case, we'll be describing uh, environment world coordinates uh, with respect to the body and not to the retina after taking these into account. So here we have, <coughs> we're getting to a representation of the body uh, that's corrected for this class of movement that allows you egocentric world coordinates. Um, now, people in, don't go and often tell you just what they were looking for exactly, but fortunately, you know, I did. Michael Land, who is uh, uh, the famous uh, compar you know, comparative visual system for, for insects, was he also developed the first uh, eye trackers, and um, he was looking for this exact thing, but even one step further, um, so and made it explicit in this paper. Do we have an internal model of the outside world? Uh, so he thought it was right here, kind of on time the. the Precuniate region, sort of uh, between the cingulate cortex, the motor cortex. That the motor system requires a representation of space that maintains a consistent relationship with objects in the outside world, um, and it could serve as a model of a stable, stable outside world, which we uh, can be conscious. He didn't particularly develop a theory of conscious. He's just uh, talking about that as a computed possibility. Okay, so. Um, and then of course, oh, I forgot also, we have, have parts of the body now that can move and we can do the same thing to this and now, now we're changing uh, location of limbs and so forth in this map. So now we have an accurate body representation of all its parts with respect to the outside world. Uh, so is that the case? Nope. <laughs> so 
Um, so in only one part, now the, the computational part has true, it sort of has to be true. Um, you know, so you have to have those, you have to generate um, a relationship of a body to the external world and you have to take into account eye movements and head movements and hand movements and so forth. But the question is, are these laid out in sequential explicit maps? People were really looking for, you know, a cortical area that was the head centered map, that was the body centered map. Uh, one guy spent his whole life looking for the auditory spatial map in the in the parietal cortex. Never found one. Um, you know, there is no such map. Um, so, um, so what do you find? And this 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 was looked at in combination with connectionist modeling. This is the first work of a, a connectionist model used to inform how to understand uh, visual motor processing, visual motor uh, Zipser and Anderson. Okay, so. This was you're looking in 7A. The question was specifically, how is it that um, a retinal location of a stimulus and an eye position are combined? You know, so they are, is it done as you were an engineer in some sort of algebraic way? But it turns out um, it does, it's done in an odd way, which is what seems to be almost a kind of random combinatorial thing of, of a uh, Gaussian for the, so you find single neurons that will have a preferred retinal location, but that preferred retinal location must be uh, multiplied by a ramp that is the position of the eye. And since we have any number of preferred retinal locations and any number of eye positions, then we will get a collection of neurons. And this is the collection of your 12 neurons and their response properties, which is a, a so they're orient they're organized here by uh, where their uh, visual receptive field is, I believe, um, and but it's not particularly important. But and and what on, is on this axis is the complexity, or sort of the bumpiness of the map. So so it's something like um, a location Gaussian times a ramp, um, and and it's. What they use their their connections modeling and association with is to to find to realize that you could produce a uh, organized map um, not by um, the 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 organized um, computation is not going to be um, visible in the brain. What it it appears in is the organization of connections. That these make so um, experience or something has collected some set of these receptive fields that in some uh, specify a particular uh, head centered then body centered um, position in space uh, it's not laid out in the topography uh, these kinds of maps i said this is the same white thing but this zipser and anderson's maps are here okay um, and then you, you find this uh, same thing, uh, sort of two by three combinatorial maps and four, including vestibular information, also somatosensory, sometimes auditory, and any number of different um, kinds of combinatorial outcomes laid out here, um, all of which can direct eye, head, body, hand movements in, in the representation. On the side, I picked out just uh, work of Carol Colby and colleagues, um, and this is a similar kind of thing. So, uh, so the question here is: Is there a single map of kind of the body in Cartesian space, and uh, much the same way? And the answer to that is no. They there's a bunch of overlaid maps that are each kind of uh, directed at the uh, acquiring organs. So we have a mouth-centered map and a nose-centered map and a hand-centered map and so forth. And those um, those um, topographic features are, are represented as different kinds of things in the areas here, MIP, VIP, LIP. Uh, these are the area five and area seven are the bounding areas. I was just talking about Zipser and um, Anderson in um, Area seven. So, um, 
what we what we kind of, what kind of things we find here um, uh, head centered maps uh, that uh, uh, will um, respond to a trajectory to the mouth arm centered uh, and reaching centered that um, a visual receptive field on the skin of the hand no matter where the skin where that hand is in visual space for example grasp related hand shaped to match a target that you desire to pick up an object centered representation. Um, if the uh, uh, person is looking at an object, the uh, neuron will respond better if it's looking at the left side of the object, but no no matter where the whole object is in, in the visual field of the, in this case, the monkey or the person. So, so we have here um, uh, a very different kind of layout than what was expected. And so I'm actually gonna be finishing right here with just that. Um, Observations. So we get. We start with, with two dimensions, two systems here with, with um, similar functions and sort of orienting and avoiding, but they're implemented and and integrated together entirely different, but um, differently, but um, kept um, but kept in the same brain and the you know not me and the. Uh, Midbrain, um, the spirit is, is is important component, and it was not overwritten or anything. So the 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 um, tactum or spirit colliculus has exactly corresponding sensory and motor, explicit topographic maps what people were looking for in the cortex. Its center central computation is winner take all, and you want that for motor decisions. You don't want to get two sources of excitation and average them and jump for some nothing in the middle between the two. So it's a very decision oriented kind of um, uh, central computation. Uh, it's notably quite plastic for body, body size or for addition of new sensory systems or losses of them as in blind canefish, but it's other plasticity is otherwise limited for new kinds of uh, disturbances, I guess. Uh, cortical cortical areas on the other hand, they don't reflect any single stage in computation of an integrated spatial map. That's not to say that there aren't stages, they're just not uh, identical with a cortical area. Um, so within the very general egocentric explainer, uh, frameworks right here that assemblies of neurons can be selected from a variety of areas, stabilized for multiple functions and communicate and maybe stabilized in multiple areas. And I think possibly uh, the next talk will be uh, dealing with some of those kinds of assemblies for actions. Um, and then coming back to the point I made early on, if this, this is a critical and necessary function, uh, to get any visual motor organization of the kind we have to work. Um, it's very interesting organization. It's obviously very permissive of plasticity and it's very easy to see how it could be um, uh, employed for multiple functions, this same kind of uh, loose distribution and um, stabilization um, within a combinatorial array that you see in the cortex for any number of possible functions that that uh, information could direct. So uh, that's all here and I'll be unsharing, I guess. So. <laughs> Thanks, Barbara. Uh, that was very interesting. Uh, so there are a couple of questions actually from Paul Paul, if you want okay, to, um, can you hear me? Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Where's my screen? So, um, where is my, um, <laughs> oh, there we go. I think at the top. I'm not intending to leave. Oh, no, you don't want to uh, leave. I just want to get out of my. Just leave the presentation mode. I guess you already did that. I think if you hover on yourself, hover on your picture. I hover, but I'm mouse. not getting a. Um... Yeah. If you hover your mouse on your picture, I think you get a menu that says uh, stop sharing. I can't hear very well. It's trouble because I'm turned down so much. 
So if you hover your, yeah, so there you should be able to see. Maybe I can do it myself. I don't know how. Can you, can just, you eject just eject me, eject perhaps? Me, perhaps? Can you, can you eject, eject me? I, uh, I can stop the sharing. Yeah. Okay, yeah that's I good. should okay. have done this before. Sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, I was saying that there were a couple of questions from Paul, actually. So maybe, Paul, you can. Uh, yeah. So uh, actually, I, wanted, I, had, I had two. Um, mm -hmm. Let me ask, ask the second one first. Mm -hmm. Um. When you describe this, these two maps, the egocentric, sort of mm -hmm. topologically or, organized, topographically organized map, mm -hmm. and the non-egocentric, I've always been very interested in that distinction and where exactly the, the border is. And one of the things that has uh, come to occur to me after reading other stuff is that it seems to me that the non-egocentric thing you describe corresponds roughly, at least in large part, to a different part of the pallium, essentially, the lateral pallium. So, so in, in Luis's totally. toilet, mm -hmm. um, they've uh, assigned, they've suggested that that regions such as agranular orbitofrontal, agranular insular, and perirhinal cortex, as well as some uh, related structures like the claustrum, are actually lateral pallium which is very different than dorsal pallium. And mm -hmm. those are the ones that are often described as being sort of the non-egocentric and even a lot of parts of the temporal cortex. And maybe, maybe Bruno can say more about this. There are parts of the temporal cortex that might also belong to that kind of different um, mm -hmm. part of the pallium. And therefore, what remains as the topographic part is the sort of dorsal pallium and this dorsomedial part that's sort of in the in the midline and and I, I guess I just wanted you I just wanted to sort of start that discussion maybe with, both with you and Luis because it seems to me that it's almost like uh, there's there's essentially lateral pallium is doing this this more non egocentric thing and dorsal pallium is doing a more egocentric thing. Um, yeah. So Barbara, if I can stop you there just a second. Uh, so there is someone in the chat, David Murphy, is suggesting that you have two tabs with Crowdcast open. I have so two Crowdcast open? Two tabs. So that might be causing the echo. Uh, I, don't I don't see, 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 see it. it. No, because maybe when you were sharing the screen, uh, he saw it. Because th there is a lot of echo that... Uh, I mean, we can hear okay, you. Okay, I, I see. I'm trying to figure out which is which. I get. I see it now. Okay, now it's much better. No, now you quit. Yeah, we lost her. Do we lose her? Hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, sorry about, sorry, because uh, I thought it could be, the sound could be improved, but I think we lost Barbara. I mean, I think. Um, let me let me just kind of jump in because sure. Paul, you mentioned the the egocentric versus the non egocentric, um, and and I, I I think you can you know I think that there's a good reason to think that either lateral or ventral lateral pallium right was I, I think of it in terms of it was important for identifying maybe objects and properties of objects in the world, but not necessarily knowing where they are. Or how to get to them, and then the medial pallium, right, was ha had the maps, so that helped you get to things in space. And the dorsal pallium, I think, has a bit of a split personality because I think it sort of sits between the two, and and the ventral part becomes then more right. Te is going to be the ventral part, and the dorsal part is going to be parietal, and it's going to be more sort of map like. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, if you look at very early mammals, uh, as, as sort of sketched out by Kaz and Kubitzer and others, there isn't much, um, much sort of temporal cortex, or I mean, it's almost like there's piriform, and then there's this tiny little strip of cortex, that's sort of insular. And that's it. And after that, you've got the, right. you've got the sensory maps. Um, and so it really looks like you know, the 
the spatial thing dominated sort of ancestral dorsal pallium. And it was kind of a spatial somatotopy, somatomotor, frankly, um, mm -hmm. as, yeah. Barb, as Barb describes. Um, Can I, um, and then there was yeah. that, that lateral section that grew much later. Yeah, go ahead. We, we in the uh, paper with Malcolm, we have a, a hypothesis about that, uh, and which I'm developing right now and doing some modeling on. So I, I think the distinction is uh, the anatomical description is as you say, um, and, I, and if I, somebody has said this already or whatever, I think the distinction is between um, systems that are using a spatially distributed event kind of organization like uh, memory in the hippocampus and olfaction, which have, don't have a uh, nearest neighbor spatial organization in them. Um, and then all the other ones where nearest neighbor information is very critical to analysis, which is motor system, sensory system, all that. And, and so what we're doing right now is, is basically, a, a, we're trying to sort of uh, basically a con connectionist modeling. The hypothesis, those things can't coexist. Uh, that um, they inter those two methods of organizing information, if they're in the same part of the brain, compete. And so that it, that's very easy to show. <laughs> in fact, in connections model, if you put, if you re require um, something like an ol olfactory input and a um, uh, object kind of analysis to co-occur, they, they interfere with each other. Um, and is that essentially because there's a trade-off that if you want mm -hmm. if you want um, a lot of feature selectivity then mm -hmm. you, you you will lose acuity spatial acuity and vice versa that kind of trade-off or no or no i mean i think this is really basic to so if, if you look at the olfactory system um it's really got to be increasingly clear that that um Space, spatial information could be could be used in olfaction as a, uh, like a chromatograph sort of that you know time of nearest neighbor things could have been important in the olfactory analysis but they're not it turns out that's pretty much where the research is going so that that uh, recognizing an odorant depends on a spatially distributed collection of of you know, particular excitation. There's no information gained by which things lie next to each other. Um, and that's also true for uh, an, a, an event that the hippocampus might encode together. Um, so that would be the motivational state, what's in the visual field, what's, you know, what are you physically doing, all those kinds of things, which have in them uh, spatial components, but they, uh, but what they're putting together are just things that temporally co-occur in one instant. So um, on the other hand, uh, particularly in vision and, um, and, but also in auditory systems. So auditory tonotopy is just like vision. Um, and that's, that's also in the temporal lobe. There are many things that depend on local um, spatial information, um, that are can be in the dorsal convexity as well. So it's not exactly, I think, that the temporal lobe is sort of um, more non-spatial because uh, spatial and and having a topographic neural organization are not uh, are not identical. You can have uh, as an audition, you can have topographic things that have uh, no external world spatial component. Is that is it? So I think I think the brain, um, right from the get go is trying keeps keeps pushing these systems apart, and I couldn't figure out what the world why was doing that. And I think it's a computational problem of they can't exist sufficiently. So I think Luis wanted to say something. I, I'd like to comment that. Um, when doing this sort of mapping overall maps of the cortex and functions of our cortex and mm -hmm. so on, it's, it's a, a bit um, difficult and also a bit dangerous to mix developmental concepts with anatomical concepts. Mm 
I see that many of the functional maps are being done with the conception that the occipital pole, the, where you have the visual primary cortex, that it's the posterior cortex or posterior pole of the cortex. And that's not true. From a topological point of view, the posterior cortex is the temporal pole. That's the posterior cortex. So the, the entire temporal cortex is posterior to parietal cortex. That's the idea that you need to, to have in mind. Why? Because the posterior pole coincides with the position of the amygdala. In all the series of mammals and all the series of non-mammals, the amygdala represents the posterior pole of the telencephalon. So it happens that in, in primates, the, the enormous growth of the, of the cortex makes that the, the amygdala gets into the, the temporal pole, and that may, means that the entire hemisphere is bent upon itself. But that is irrelevant for the neurons and for the functions. So the, the, the fact that you have a new occipital pole is absolutely irrelevant for any functional analysis. You have to forget about it. So you have to think that if you are in the frontal cortex, you are rosal. If you are near the amygdala, you are caudal. And the visual cortex is in between, somewhere in between. So, so that is a point that I see that in many functional mapping, uh, people just uh, apply topographic criteria. Where is my cortex in, in my brain when I take in the hands? But that is not the real brain. The brain is bent, is deformed morphogenetically. That means that you need to know which morphogenesis is affecting the relative positions. So I see also here a comment by Malcolm saying that the lateral pallium is the olfactory domain in ancestral vertebrates. That is a, a, a confusion of two different nomenclatures. The lateral pallium was olfactory, was used olfactory at, uh, in, the, in the old uh, uh, three-partite three model of the pallium, but now we are working with four parts or five parts, six parts, or even with the ring model. And, and that all, the, all terminology is completely obsolete. So when we refer to lateral pallium, as Paul said before, we refer to insular perirhinal cortex and nothing to do with olfactory cortex. It's just a, a de facto, we, we, unfortunately, we continue using a, the same word, lateral. And that is very confusing. So you need to, to know your development and your evolution to know and also the changes in terminology that have happened over time so that the old papers don't refer to the same things as the new papers. So I know that this is a lot of complexity, but I still think that the validity of the general analysis uh, that Barbara has shown very nicely in this mapping of egocentric and non-egocentric fields in the cortex, I think it can be adapted to the notion that the temporal region is posterior. I don't see there is any, any problem in that. I, I think it's just a matter of, of being a bit more realistic. No, exactly. In fact, what, 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 mm -hmm. I, what I was alluding mm -hmm. to is the idea that the, the temporal cortex, which, yes, you're right, topologically is the caudal end of the pallium, mm -hmm. Um, it, it, um, was, you know, at least part of it, lateral pallium, non-egocentric and upon expanding really, and not until primates, mm -hmm. that part forms the big temporal lobe of primates expanding, you know, sort of forward, but it really is still a, a, a caudal part that's still relatively closely related to all those lateral um pallial regions like perirhinal cortex and it just happens to it just happens to ex has expanded i mean i think if you look at the kind of a flattened topological brain of an early sort of stem mammal it's you know or actually frankly the the, the mouse uh which doesn't have much of a temporal it doesn't have a temporal lobe and then it's actually i think much easier to so if i can interrupt interrupt uh, i'm sorry but uh, maybe we should move on and have uh, bruno's talk because yeah, i think bruno actually has all the answers to these questions <laughs> <laughs> so bruno if you want to uh, to share your screen yeah i'm gonna, i'm uh yeah all right so okay we... you got the screen shared oh that was fun. Oh, how's that yeah perfect okay Thanks. great um
Okay, so uh, thank you for inviting me. This is um, this is this is quite fun for me. Um, I I think my talk will sort of pick up where um, where Manuel left off with the chapter. I'm going to be talking about primates. I'm going to be talking about anatomy, which I know um, a lot of people talk about organization and the absence of anatomy. But um, just a little bit of background on me. There we go. Um, so I'm primarily a, a neurophysiologist working in macaques, and I study neural correlates of behavior. So I don't know if Paul introduced himself a while ago, but we do very similar work. I use anatomical connectivity to guide hypotheses about where, we're, where we expect to find certain kinds of function. So the goal of the work in the lab is to understand the organization and function of neural circuits. Um, and today I'm going to be talking just about organization, not really about function. So the goal of this talk is really how do we make sense of this kind of data? So what I'm showing here, I hope people can see my mouse moving. This is, this is um, the macaque brain. So this is a lateral view. This is a ventral view. And this is a medial view. Um, these are coronal sections on the right over here. And what a lot of anatomists like to do when they're trying to study connectivity is um, they place an injection somewhere. This is an injection in orbital frontal cortex area 11. This is a retrograde tracer. So then they go through the brain and they try to find all the cells that project to area 11. And so each of these dots is a cell or a few cells that are projecting up to area 11. And this is showing the um, the injection on the ventral surface here. So the question is, you know, we, we get one injection like this. What does this tell us about the brain and um, how do we use this to understand brain, brain organization a little bit better? Now, there are at least thousands of injections like this, maybe tens of thousands. And we can use those injections to make wiring diagrams that look like this. Um, so this is actually lateral prefrontal cortex here, macaque lateral prefrontal cortex. This is orbital prefrontal cortex, and this is medial prefrontal cortex. And the goal of this diagram actually is not to generate insight, but really just to show how complicated the connectivity is, right? So people have done decades and decades of research like this, and they have mapped out an enormous number of anatomical connections between areas. Um, in, in in the cortex and i, I want to make one point quickly that ties back a little bit to barb's talk she was talking about gain fields and the kinds of representational maps that you find in cortex um and talking about how they're important for plasticity i would suggest that what the kinds of representations you find in cortex are good for is for learning complex associations across things that maybe aren't obviously related to each other right and also, I would suggest that this kind of connectivity we see here is also important for bringing together things for learning that we wouldn't normally associate, um, you know, in space necessarily. Well, that's just kind of an offhand comment. So we have this sort of very complicated, large opus of work looking at anatomical connectivity. Um, but a lot of people have tried to reduce and simplify this large, complicated opus of work into um, simpler principles and there are many of these principles but there are four that i like to use so i tend to work in prefrontal cortex maybe parietal frontal cortex and so i think about what i'll call the you know the association circuitry in classical terms so most of what i'm going to say today it doesn't necessarily apply to v1 or a1 we do have s1 and m1 in the model but definitely more interested in prefrontal cortex parietal cortex etc so I think you can account for a lot of the connectivity in the cortex with four principles, and it's really kind of three and a half principles. So the first is what I refer to as the nested model of neocortical connectivity. Um, and this is something that I came up with with Roberto Caminiti some years ago. The second is shared subcortical targets of connected cortical areas. This is an idea that was first put forward by Yetarian and Van Hessen in 1978. Um, it was expanded by Patricia Goldman Rakesh in the 80s. Topographic connectivity in frontal striatal circuits. Um, this idea, really, this idea goes way back even to the 60s, but Suzanne Haber has really developed it a lot recently. 
and uh, I, I did some computational modeling on her data. And then related to the third point, fourth point is the topographic organization in cortical basal ganglia thalamocortical circuits. So um, really that just says that this topographic connectivity that we see in frontal striatal circuits continues throughout these loop circuits um, that were referred to earlier. And the idea that I would like to put forward, and I'm quite interested to hear people's uh, ideas, you know, feedback on this idea, is that these four principles follow from the way the brain evolved and the way it develops. And the simple idea is that the dorsal pallium expanded massively on the lineage leading to primates. At the same time that it expanded, the basal ganglia and the thalamus expanded, but during this expansion, topological connectivity was maintained. So we expanded, topological connectivity was maintained, so adjacency relationships were maintained, and that gave us a bunch of gradients of connectivity in the brain. And those gradients of connectivity explain um, a lot of the connectivity we see, not all of the connectivity we see. Okay, so I'm just going to step through the four principles. So this is, again, this is a lateral view of the macaque brain. And what we do to generate a figure like this is we generate a giant table of connectivity between areas. And these are all little architectonically defined areas. And then we cluster together areas that have similar inputs. So we use cluster analyses. And the blue, and we tend to fit these separately for what I'll call posterior areas, which are approximately areas behind the central sulcus and anterior areas, which are areas in front of the central sulcus. And TE, TEO here is counted as behind the central sulcus. So we cluster together areas that have similar inputs. And what I'm showing here is color-coded areas that all are clustered together with a cluster analysis we've developed. And then we identify the um, the dominant posterior input, the cluster in the posterior part of the brain that gives the largest input to each frontal cluster. So for example, this is premotor cortex. And if you look at the posterior cluster that gives the largest input to premotor cortex, it comes from this dorsal parietal area up here. If we look in dorsal prefrontal cortex up here, dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, um, we get this cluster here. Much of this cluster is actually buried in the interparietal sulcus. So if we look at these maps, we find that at the core of these maps, there's a strong connection between M1 and S1. But then around this core, there's a ventral parietal to ventral premotor connection that's very strong. There's a dorsal premotor to dorsal parietal connection. There's a slightly more caudal parietal connection to dorsal prefrontal cortex. And there's a, a temporal lobe, TETEO, connection into ventral lateral prefrontal cortex. So, and I'm, of course, ignoring here auditory cortex, which is intercalated. I think that's interesting, but a little bit harder to incorporate into this scheme. This is visual cortex behind here, which I'm also ignoring. As I said, I tend to focus on these association multimodal cortices. So if we flatten this out, we can get this nest, nested model of cortical connectivity. At the core, we have M1 and S1. Then if we go um, caudal from S1, we get dorsal parietal cortex, which is connected to dorsal premotor cortex, ventral parietal cortex, which is connected to ventral premotor cortex, this parietal ML area, which is connected to dorsal prefrontal, and TE, which is connected to ventral prefrontal cortex. So it's this um, expanding ring architecture accounts for a lot of the connectivity in lateral cortex. So the next principle is shared subcortical targets of connected areas. So if we look at the subcortical targets, and here I'm going to be talking about the striatum or the subpallium um, and the thalamus. Specifically, I'm going to focus on the medial dorsal thalamus, although some of this applies as well to the pulvinar. If we look where in the striatum and the medial dorsal thalamus, that parietal ML and, and dorsal prefrontal cortex project, they tend to project into overlapping territories. That's also true in, in the, the um, if we look where the dorsal parietal cortex and dorsal premotor cortex project, similar, and also for these other structures. So um, that's basically shown over here on the right in this kind of color-coded diagram here. This is the pre, um, dorsal prefrontal 
parietal ML clusters. Those are strongly connected. And if you look at where they project in the medial dorsal thalamus, they project kind of lateral and dorsal. If we look where they project into the striatum, they project into the dorsal striatum. Here I'm showing the amygdala and the prefrontal, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. So they're strongly connected and they also send projections into overlapping territories, the ventral striatum in the striatum and the sort of um, medial ventral medial part of the medial dorsal thalamus. So I'm not showing those areas on the left over here because they're a little harder to um, integrate into this. Similarly, dorsal parietal and dorsal premotor send their projections into overlapping locations in the dorsal striatum and in the lateral medial dorsal thalamus, kind of extending into this uh, central lateral nucleus. Okay, the next principle is the topographic connectivity of frontal striatal circuits. Um, the basic idea here, this is a coronal section now through prefrontal cortex. So this is lateral prefrontal cortex in the macaque. This is the medial wall and the orbital wall, and I'm showing the striatum. If we look at ventral medial prefrontal cortex, it sends a projection into the ventral striatum. If we translate, oops, if we translate dorsally from ventral medial prefrontal cortex or laterally from ventral medial prefrontal cortex, the projections into the striatum actually translate dorsal laterally in the striatum. And when we meet here at the principal sulcus taking either route, we find projections that go to the dorsal most part of the striatum. So instead of thinking about individual areas sending projections into discrete locations in the striatum, we can really think this as think of this as a continuous gradient. And as we translate along here, we translate the projection target in the striatum translates from ventral medial to dorsal lateral in the striatum. And it's so consistent that you can fit a very simple mathematical model and predict the location in the striatum from your location along this axis. And that's what we did in this 2014 paper. So that's just prefrontal striatal connectivity. That connectivity, that organization actually extends through the pallidum. So again here, now I'm showing um, prefrontal cortex. This is from a review by Tremblay et al. Um, remember we were seeing that dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex projects very dorsally. Um, orbital and ventral medial project very ventrally. Those projection patterns continue if we look at the striatal projections into the pallidum, either GPI or GPE. So in the in the monkey, the pallidum is split into a GPI and a GPE, at least the, um, the newer part of the pallidum. So basically, the topographic organization of cortical inputs to the striatum is continued into the pallidum. It also continues into the thalamus. Remember, we already saw that cortex projects topographically into the thalamus. So the part of the pallidum that projects into that location in the thalamus actually projects back to the same location in the cortex. So these are the sort of the closed um, cortical basal ganglia thalamocortical loops that were first put forward by Peter Strick and colleagues a number of years ago. So they just emphasize the fact that these loops were closed. Here I'm trying to emphasize that there's also these topographic kind of gradients um, that reflect the organization. All right, so um, the overall suggestion here is that four principles of anatomical organization can account for a large fraction of the anatomical connectivity that we see in the forebrain. There's a huge number of connections that aren't reflected by these gradients. What I'm trying to do here is put forward a model that captures the largest fraction of connections using the simplest um, possible set of principles. And I'm not showing the fourth one here, which is just the, um, the continuation of this topographic organization through the pallidum back to the thalamus and then back to cortex. So as I suggested at the beginning, it seems to me that we can account for this by just observing the fact that as the dorsal pallium expanded, the basal ganglia in the thalamus also expanded and um, if we assume that the connectivity maintain these kind of topological adjacency relationships, we can account for the organizational structure that I went through, right? So if we look at amphibians here, here's the dorsal pallium. I know there's um, some argument in the book about where the dorsal pallium first arose. For my argument, it's not important um, exactly where it first arose, but just that it's small to begin with. 
Um, here's the medial pallium. Here's the lateral pallium and the ventral pallium, as, as Luis was suggesting. There's are there are at least four areas. Um, here's the ventral striatum, which is fairly small. The dorsal striatum which is still fairly small. I've tried to look up a lot of the anatomy on this. It looks like the dorsal striatum is getting a lot of inputs from medial pallium and ventral lateral pallium, even in amphibians, which makes it a little more kind of ventral striatum-like, but um, you know that's probably gonna be an ongoing debate. If we look at reptiles, still the dorsal pallium is a relatively small component of the entire pallium. But then of course, if we jump way ahead to primates, now we see that this dorsal pallium comes to dominate most of the um, of the pallium, sort of of the area of the pallium. If we go caudally, it's an even larger component. So basically, as this dorsal pallium expanded, the dorsal striatum also expanded, but we maintain topological arrangements in connectivity, right? So the the pallium people have put forward the idea that the pallium expanded from two nodes, and this goes back to the tripartite organization, which, um, which of course, Luis doesn't like very much. But as a kernel of an idea, I think it is actually very suggestive. suggestive. So, um, you know, caudal to OFC here in piriform cortex, we have an area that projects into the ventral striatum. This is an area that projects also into the ventral striatum. And as cortex expanded in these two directions, the striatum expanded this way and we maintained connectivity, right? So these areas that are adjacent to each other connect to adjacent areas in the striatum. And as we get further and further up here in the primate, we project further and further up into the cortex, or I'm sorry, into the striatum. Um, so this is actually just showing this kind of older, older idea about um, sort of the, the two origin hypothesis. We don't necessarily have to take that that seriously, but if we do assume that expansion kind of proceeded in this direction and in this direction, then that accounts for all this topological arrangement that we see um, that we see in the connectivity between prefrontal cortex and the striatum. So I think, do we end it too? Can somebody jump in? Manuel? Sorry? Do we end it too or what? Well, yeah. Uh, we, we can go a bit uh, okay. beyond. I just, I, there's, uh, if, if it's okay for all Okay, of I'll, just, I'll just mention one more thing then. So this component, um, this, this sort of frontal striatal connectivity, doesn't account for this, this ring architecture. Um, the ring architecture, though, has some really interesting properties. Um, beyond the fact that it's reflected in these kind of gradients of connectivity, if we look at the major white matter bundles that connect um, posterior areas to anterior areas in the macaque cortex, they more or less reflect this organization. So um, there's a dorsal bundle here connecting these dorsal areas to dorsal prefrontal areas. There's a ventral bundle here connecting ventral um, parietal areas to ventral motor areas and ventral prefrontal areas. There's some similar areas on the medial wall. So one possibility is, you know, we, I mean, if we go back, right, um, you know, probably we started with an S1 in the very earliest mammals, and then we added an M1. It's possible that we slowly accreted, right, an expanding ring architecture, then a parietal PMD area. You can see some of this maybe in tree shoes, looking at John Koss's work. Um, it's a little harder to see a, a, a ventral parietal, ventral premotor area. And this is a little bit related to um, the comment that Paul brought up. But if we assume that these areas started out adjacent to each other, and as they were pushed apart, they kind of dragged along these white matter bundles, uh, then maybe we see a bit of a trace of this expanding ring as, as the neopallium expanded um, left over in, in where these white matter bundles go. That's just a suggestion. So as you can see, a lot of this is kind of hand wavy hypotheses at this point. But what we know for sure, or what we're you know quite clear on is that we have this kind of four principles that we can use to reduce the complexity of um, connectivity in the forebrain of macaques. And this has been laid out by many, many anatomists before me. Um, and what I'd like to suggest is that we may be able to, if we think about um, comparative anatomy or how these areas develop, um, come up with even fewer principles that help us understand these four um, principles that I put forward. Anyway, that's all I have, thanks. I'm going to unshare.
Thank you, Bruno. That was very, mm -hmm. very interesting. Uh, Bruno, I, I think uh, you Bruno when you say that these structures expanded, uh, apparently you mean expanded in surface, apparently. Or do you think that you could think also of, of an uh, increase in thickness? Of, for, example, for instance, in the case of the striatum, expansion would probably mostly be in the direction of radial direction producing thickness um, because the area basically is, this, is conserved in evolution. No? But in the cortex, you have largely an increase in, in surface. So that, that there are two directions for, in which you can change the dimensions, relative dimensions of the different fields. But still, the idea is very interesting, of course. That's the, 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 the idea of the, the so-called ring hypothesis of the cortex, which is also what uh, Helen Barbas is now supporting, um, is this idea that, the, that, that we have to consider um, the, the hippocampal uh, archicortical ring uh, outside and a uh, mesocortical in between, which includes the lateral pallium and so on, but also cingulate cortex on the medial side and so on, and the post rhinal cortex, for instance, and the uh, orbital part of the orbital cortex, and then you get your your dorsal pallium in the in the center. No, so I I, I really feel that the old models of only four parts or three parts and so on, they are they are getting to be a bit old, because we we need more space, we need more place to put names and to put structures and connections and functions. I think that we need to evolve into the ring models. That I agree with Helen Barbas completely. Yeah, I, I think also, um, you know, Luis, that that a lot of these gradient maps are probably going to come right from transcription factor, right, expression and you mm -hmm. know gradients and those expression patterns, and that's probably how this how this organization gets set up. Uh, well, the the problem is that the 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 people studying the gene patterns, they don't think of overall models of the entire cortex. I just looking in which layer the gene appears in any in, in the standard classical areal model of Brodmann. So most people working on the genes are still working with with Brodmann. So they are, they are not thinking about are there new ways of visualizing the whole and flattened flattened cortex and so on. They they are not thinking in a topological way. So that's a problem that I should, I expect that in the coming years people will start uh, producing um, better molecular maps. Barbara wanted to add something? Yeah, um, I, I'm gonna uh, maybe ask you to elaborate on, on the idea of thalamocortical uh, connectivity being um, uh, maintained or in the way you, you said of, of uh, keeping one thing small and then interposing more stuff. So um, when, the initial embryological events to set up the cortical plate fix the relative location of the somatomotor, auditory, and visual seed areas. Um, and so um, expansion occurs around those, and those are areas of very specific thalamocortical connection that, that are obligatory. Um, but there's, there's another thing that... Uh, Doug Frost and Vernon Cavanis noticed a while back that, that is also um, interesting about cortex, which is uh, there are four big zones within uh, cortex that uh, in which the topology of um, nearest neighbor interactions in the thalamus and the cortex are maintained, and then there's a break. So, uh, so one of them is. Uh, all the visual ones up to somatosensory. So for all those things, no matter how big it gets, neighboring points in the thalamus are neighboring points in the cortex um, going across nuclei. I mean, that would be lateral geniculate and pulvinar and so forth. And then you get to a, another topically, topographically arranged zone one, which is this as motor to prefrontal. There's a sort of auditory set. I forget exactly how they go, but those are the ones I use for, um, coloring stuff I, I did on my own map. So there's, um, the, the cortex and thalamus have this very specific anchoring and, and zone um, organization to them that isn't just expansion exactly. It, it's, it's, a, it's a little more specific than that. 
Oh. Yeah, I should actually know the um, the work you mentioned. Maybe I'll email you offline to get the mm -hmm. those papers, references. Yeah. Yeah. Paul, did you want to uh, something? Um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, kind of echo something Luis just said about the the work of Helen Barbas, um, which I think really provides um, provides a very complementary piece that fits very nicely with what, what you've suggested. This idea of this concentric ring of increasingly laminated cortical regions um, bounded by increasingly disgranular and agranular regions, eventually getting to uh, sort of hippocampal on one side and piriform on the other side. Um, and I think, uh, again, if you, if you take a look at Helen Barbas's map of this kind of concentric ring, it maps very nicely into the developmental maps that Luis and others have, have developed. And there is a connectivity, right? The primary sensory input from the thalamus arrives sort of in the middle of that island and then and then goes outward to the more lateral pieces. I mean, that's that's highly simplified. There's, there's lots of, of course, projections from thalamus to all of these parts. But if you think about sort of the lateral geniculate to V1, that's kind of in that middle section. And and, and the sort of somatosensory regions also within that middle section, these kinds of three islands of somatosensory, visual, and auditory. Um, outside of that are these concentric rings. So what you're finding, the concentric rings you're finding based on connectivity, I think, line up, they sort of outline the inner island of the concentric rings that Helen Barbas finds also based on connectivity and lamination patterns and the developmental uh, uh, concentric rings that Luis and other, others are finding. Um, and I mean, I, you, you know the work of Steve Wise, who synthesized this quite nicely. And, and I think that's actually, um, you know, I think actually the data is there to take your what the principles that you've described, connect them up with the principles they've described, and have a, a really good sort of fundamental topology of a sort of a simple mammalian brain. And then each of the mammalian brains that evolved out of that, of course, has got its own little idiosyncratic violations of these principles. But the principles are never, nevertheless there. And uh, yeah, again, uh, I don't know. It, it's not a question. It's more of a um, of, of a suggestion to almost to some of my students that are here. To go go read this stuff. Read read Bruno's stuff. Read. Um, uh, Luis's stuff and and Helen Barbas's stuff because I actually think that you know those those horrible wiring diagrams that look like a plate of spaghetti <laughs> aren't telling actually the story we want. There's actually a story underlying in there that that's much cleaner and I think quite compelling. And I I think we should be interpreting it functionally. I I, I really think that the sort of vent, ventral 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 striatal regions are doing different things than the dorsal ones and and i mean i guess you know this bruno 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 said yeah i would like to comment that um, the, this large scale um concept conservation of an order across all these connections that you have described i find it very interesting from two points of view on one hand that for me it tells me that the 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 primary or initial um uh, frames, molecular frames, which uh, neurons use when they are produced and when they evolve also, that somehow there is a, a resistance to change. So that even if you increase the, number, the size of the areas or you uh, duplicate areas or you subdivide areas and so on, still the system apparently is extremely conservative so that it conserves the, the, that produces this conservation of, of order, order in the in the connectivity, which is also a conservation of function, of course, no. Uh, and a different aspect, but this tells about the same topic, is that probably you do not change the, the tracts. How about the tracts? I, I would guess that you don't change at all the tracts in the brain. That the tracts are the same; they, they practically don't change. You don't have new big tracts when you move from a mouse to a primate, the, the tracks are the same, only that they carry many, many more fibers. But so that tells you that there is a tendency to keep the, the order that you, you had at the beginning, at, the, at least at the beginning of mammals, but probably many of these things already started 
many million years before, no? in non-mammals, of course. So there are beginnings of these things before, but once you start with the mammals and you have produced your first mammalian brain, then you simply cannot change. You have to continue keeping the same structure. You can evolve it, you can make it more potent, a better computer, you can elaborate and mostly the functions that can be attempted, but still the basic structure is that of a mammalian cortex or a mammalian striatum and so on and so on. So there's an enormous tendency to conservation. That's what I feel in the whole, how, when I read about all these things, that's my feeling that things basically are keeping as they were. They are just uh, introducing many more elements, introducing variability in many other functional aspects. So it's- Yeah, but this, this has an extremely important implication for theories because human life is really different than animal life right mm -hmm. um and yet when you look at the brain in terms of these ba basic patterns it's not that different and so that suggests that as you said you just cannot reorganize this thing and 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 build a whole new system that let's say no, is really not, really like, optimized for human you have to work on what you had before yeah, and but but I think that's that's very important because there's a lot of theories out there in in computational neuroscience that talk about the human human brain and human abilities without considering the fact that most of those mechanisms that that one might conceive as being really good mechanisms for dealing with human life just never really entered into the game. It was never even possible for the brain to come up with these things because it's it was constrained and it, you just can't redesign. You can't rewire completely. Uh, and I think that's really important. This is something I always struggle with because I, I record in monkeys and then I talk to people who study mm -hmm. human. Well, I also study humans uh, and they're like, well, you know, it's just a monkey. But the fact is that, you know, my brain is not that different than that monkey, <laughs> even though my life is quite different. Mm -hmm. That's a big deal. So if, if I can, uh, well, this, uh, we are more than two hours now. If, you, if it's OK for all of you, we can still discuss. I, last word, I just want to say that maybe Georg, if he's hearing us, we will be very happy because the entire uh, the, the, line, the big line of his book is that the, the, they are interested in the novelties. So, so but I think that novelty can be admitted as an adaptation of what we had before. So I don't think that I am speaking against this idea of, of interest in novelty. So. so Barbara, you wanted to say something else? No, I, uh, this is something I, I've ended up arguing all the time. And since I've often talked about uh, you know conservative brain circuitry and conservative allometry and, and so forth, uh, but one thing you have to keep in mind is that there are two things that are the case that that uh, animals behave really differently, and you know mammals are really different from them. They have different capacities, and this sort of cellular architecture and the numbers and so forth um, are pretty conserved. So mm -hmm. uh, those things are both true. So that tells you you really need to look at different factors that are changing to produce the kind of diversity. And I think the things that we're always overlooking is sort of the um, motivational architecture of the brain in terms of, um, you know, different kinds of things that, that could sort of enter into that, you know, dopamine handshake and the accumbens and so forth and, and redirect profoundly the interest of the animal, what kind of sensory system, sensory information it gets in what context and what kind of brain it builds. And we just never, uh, I mean, we're always sort of worrying about, look, the brains are so different and their fundamental, their really fundamental architecture is the same. Well, that something is different. And I, I think we need to uh, get out of just, uh, you know, noticing that there's a problem between the fundamental architecture and find out, okay, what do, what, what aspects of brain structure and, and particularly, um, you know, the, the number of receptors and the location for, uh, you know, nonopeptides is just churning across animals. And I think we need to start to really incorporate that in, in as well as just these um, really basic wiring diagram things to understand how things change.
So I don't know if uh, there was a question by Luis Pessoa. Uh, I don't know if you have still five minutes. Uh, it was a question for, so I will invite him uh, to join the stage. Uh, hopefully he's still around. Oh, that's a good question. <clears throat> I don't see the questions. I don't know where they. It's in the question and answers. Ask a question. Do I click on that? Yeah. Uh, no, it should just be underneath there. Well, I I I, I like the pay. I saw Louis yesterday. Actually, he was uh, mm -hmm. here giving a talk. Um, I like the papers you guys have been writing a lot on these topics, Louis, and um, and. Changes in the pallial subpallial amygdala. Do you mean you mean across like a comparative changes? Which changes specifically? Can you? Um... He's joining the stage, so probably he would be able to. Okay, I mean, I think one thing. The one thing I was thinking of in the in the context of the discussion we were just having is if you look between rodents, which are primary primarily olfactory and primates, the amygdala becomes a much more visual structure in primates, whereas it's a much more olfactory structure in rodents. Um, so that's one way to take a structure which, you know, sits in the same position, looks very similar, but you can rewire it a little bit to adapt to a different kind of ecological niche. Yeah, he's, yeah he said yes, comparative changes, but I don't know why it's taking so long to join. Well, I, I don't know. I don't have to write. <laughs> he can hear me. Can you? Are you having travels to join, Luis? Or he says accepted and and connecting. Yeah. I mean, if you could, if you can, if you want to answer in the meantime, uh, keep or Paul, if you want I, to. I, I actually would. I would. I would actually love to hear Luis' comment because he he's been working with um, you know Loretta Medina and some others, really trying to look at how that circuitry is changing um in a comparative way across the like from amphibians right um up to mammals and i don't have any detailed oh yes yeah. i see yes because the pallial amygdala is really a frontotemporal system frontal temporal so so I think of the amygdala in general and the macaque as being the posterior node, right? A posterior node of a system that's connected to ventral, medial, and caudal orbital. And then the amygdala and ventral medial send projections into, right, the same region of the striatum, the ventral striatum. Um, and the ventral striatum is, is right, it's, 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 here he comes, I think. Yeah. Hey, Luis, can you can see you. Yes. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's super slow because everything was kind of freezing here on my end. So do let me know if you hear me. We, we can hear you. Okay, great. So because, I mean, Bruno, it was, it was an amazing presentation and you were emphasizing the, 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 the striatum and, and and the axis in the dorsal to ventral and, and the different types of connectivity. connectivity. But it would be really fascinating if you could also consider how that might play with the changes that you're envisioning uh, from, from amphibians on or from whatever point onwards or, or just uh, uh, in mammals itself, like how the organization of the, the the amygdala itself, the paleo amygdala, is, is really deeply connected with much of cortex, right? So if you, if you, and with all sectors of the paleo, right, the, 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 cor the cortex. So if you were envisioning these changes, then there should be some <coughs> principle also apply in, in the sense that how that affects, how the amygdala is, is, is doing this communication with, um, with, with the rest of cortex, right? So in a sense, it's, um, it has its heavy connections with uh, medial prefrontal cortex, orbital frontal cortex, and, and a few other, in temporal cortex, obviously. And, and, and so the extent to which 
So I see, I sort of see a parallel story to what you were drawing in the ventral striatum to see this would be naturally expanded to, to see how this would, would or would not be consistent with your overall story. The amygdala would be also, I think, a really important component to consider because it's sort of like a major connectivity hub. And in fact, one of the ideas that, that we've been discussing with um, Loretta Medina and Esther Desfilis is, is, is the idea that it, it really also creates um, a, a, a striatal like kind of loop structure, very much like the classical basal ganglia loops, an idea that obviously goes back to Al Heidenheimer in, in rodents, a, a system that goes via, via the, the, the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis and, and cycling back through the, the thalamus to cortex in a more open loop architecture, but having some parallel there to the overall structure of these loops that there are classical basal ganglia loops. So I, it'd be just, it's more of a, a comment in a sense, but kind of like a wish list of hearing your ideas or, or it'd be wonderful if, if you, in your thinking, you incorporated that to see the extent to which that makes sense or not in the sense that we can think of the, the paleo amygdala as, 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 as a, a sector of the pallium that also funnels through these kinds of loops that have been described more classically with the standard classical basal gang ganglia kind of loops. So I don't know, this is more ideas kind of bumping around in my head that I thought uh, that, I, that I just asked you on. But I, yeah, I no, also I understand that it's, it's 212. No, I, I, I think I think there could be a number of comments there. I, I, I want to say that I, my interest in the amygdala actually led me into a lot of the comparative literature, and, um, and I liked, um, like one of Luis Poyas's early ring ring models had the amygdala kind of hanging off the side, and I was like, well, how do we? <laughs> and I was like, I don't know how to in incorporate it, and I think it is a it's a difficult structure. That, that drawing was just to emphasize that the amygdala is not a cortex. That yeah. the, the, in the in the pallium you have the cortical pallium and you have the amygdala pallium. They are two different regions, so that you can you can paint them as as hanging apart. Although obviously in the normal brain they are together. And but I think conceptually, you, when you say disconnect with the amygdala, it's not the same as saying disconnect with this other area of the cortex. You, you have passed the frontier with the amygdala, so you are now in a different system, part of the system. It's a different part of the system. That, that is the main new idea with the amygdala, that, that is not a part of the cortex. Because in all the papers... Right, sure. it's, it's, not really it's part of the cortex, but, but it's, it's also, also very part part of the cortex. Like, Okay, so 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 that is uh, why I do these sort of paintings <laughs> or schemata. I, I think I think there's another interesting idea around too, which actually ties together a little bit with what Barb said and something I read in in maybe Jörg's um, first book, which is that with the cortex, the sheet architecture and the anatomical innervation in mammals is really good at is is building maps, right? And that that's kind of. Mm -hmm kind of what it's there for. And then you have the amygdala, which is a nuclear architecture. And maybe the reason that this nuclear architecture is still hanging around is that when you're trying to do some kinds of learning, there are some kind of associations that you want to build that are not as easy to build with a map, right? And so maybe the nuclear architecture makes it a little bit more amenable to building some kinds of arbitrary associations between stimuli and outcomes. That That's a vague idea that I've had related to all these comments we're making here. But I, Luis, I also, um, Luis Pessoa, I, I actually totally fully agree with, I, I really like the idea because I like simple models of thinking about the amygdala, right, as having, you know, sort of the Paleol, right, sub paleol BNST organization. I know there was a recent paper looking at the developmental origins, I think, of BNST and looking at whether it was um, like the medial ganglionic eminence or the caudal. I can't remember. 
But it seems like if you look at the developmental origin of the BNST, it's not quite as clean as the pallidum. You maybe know this paper. Well, uh, the, the story is quite, quite complicated. I don't think we have a, this is the place to, to, to describe the, how the BST complex gets developed. It's, uh, for me, it's a, it's a very, very, very complex subject that in the literature is not perfectly resolved. So I think in the in, in in the coming year we will see new studies of the whole system that probably put some order into it. So 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 we right now we only have very crude ideas about this whole thing. But it's true that for any part of the subpallium that connects with the cortex, this upper a different part of the subpallium that connects with the amygdala. So in that sense, they are analog analog systems in the sense that you have a pallial domain connecting or putting its output through a, through a subpallial domain. So they are analogous in that sense. But one is cortical and the other is amygdala. So it's completely different in, in its origin. So there must be some functional difference. So your, the physiologists are the ones that need to investigate, <laughs> or the psychologist, which is the difference between the amygdala and the cortex. <laughs> Centrally, they don't do the same. <laughs> okay. Ah, oh, sorry, Mara. Uh, I, there, there is um, an interesting sort of a relationship between um, the things that Bruno was talking about, about um, structures that, uh, that learn um, or, or they are useful in sort of learning models rather and um, uh, nuclear structures and duration of neurogenesis and allomacry. Okay, so those, mm -hmm. those things all converge on the same thing. Uh, uh, things that are generated for a long time by nature tend to make cortical structures uh, just because of the, uh, uh, how are you gonna dispose of all those cells? Nuclear structures for the most part are the smaller ones. That means if they're part of a circuit that has a ex large expanding parts, small parts, that, that's dimension reduction right there, okay? And, and dimension reduction is, is what you need typically to describe something that's going to be learned. So if you're gonna, so the, the things that are kept small have tend to have particular functions in connected circuits because those are places where uh, more um, stabilization or analysis of what's going on in the larger structure can be produced. Do you see what, um, yeah, so there's this funny connection between neurogenesis and learning models and nuclear versus cortical that I don't think is random. Um, it's, it's, it is known that a vision in, the, in your amygdala can make you believe that you are God. For instance, there was a case of a, of a that you commented in the literature, I don't remember right now precisely the source, but there was somebody that had had a, by an accident had had a lesion of the connectivity within his amygdala and and the cortex, and he his symptom was that he thought he was God. <laughs> So there you are with amygdala. So, so what is that? <laughs> ah, it must be, it must be a very common accident. <laughs> he felt that he loved everything, and if you love, he thought that if I love everything, I must be God. That was his. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was uh, what he had in his head. So you see, it's it's uh, functionally very interesting to mm -hmm. not only what is the function of the cortex, but what is the function of. The because obviously they are interacting, they are they are working together, so it's a very important problem. Okay, maybe we should uh, leave it there. Stop. It's twenty minutes over. So thanks a lot uh, to the speakers for staying twenty minutes over the time. This was very interesting. Uh, thank you all for the questions and for being there, still being there. Um, and yeah, we will see you in the last session of the Brains to Time Reading Club. Uh, um, yeah, hope, you, hope to see you all there. Thanks. See you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Hi. Thank you.